This is a continual journey. Don't expect perfection. It is so hard on us. There is no human on this planet that's perfect, no matter how much they may say they are. So don't think you're a failure if you fall. Just know every other human falls on their face all the time. Most people just don't admit it. I've been having a lot of conversations recently and a trend has kind of emerged. Struggling on carnivore. I have been doing this more than 10 months now and I've had my ups and downs. Most of you probably have known and have been there with me on them. So I wanted to go back to the basics. The three things that I think are the most vital to focus on if you are struggling or even if you're doing really well, just focusing on that 98%, not the 2%. And what I consider 2% is worrying about things like artificial sweeteners when you're having carbs every other meal or every few days. Let's focus together on that 98%, getting that down pat before we worry about fine tuning the diet. The three things that I think are fundamental for the basics is getting fat adapted, consistency, and learning our hunger signals. Let's start talking about fat adaptation first. Getting fat adapted, that is the entire point of carnivore. It's an elimination diet to figure out what you are having allergies to, but also specifically around weight loss is getting fat adapted. Why? Because we want our bodies to burn our own fuel source, which is the fat that's on us. In the beginning, I started off eating three meals a day and snacks. I ate very frequently. I did this because my body was still burning sugar and carbs, so glucose, for energy. And I know myself, I am a binge eater. I have to be aware that when I get hungry, my mind just perseverates on food. To get over this, in the start, I ate a lot all the time. I ate until I physically felt full. I think it's actually really important to do that, to not try to throw fasting or minimize the amount you're eating in the beginning because you want your body to go from sugar, carb, the glucose burning, to fat burning. Why? Because once you get fat adapted, you'll notice your hunger just starts naturally decreasing. You have a streamlined process of if you haven't eaten something, your body can use the fat on you. That system isn't set into place when you are burning sugar and carbs. Personally, I do not suggest fasting in the beginning if you're a binge eater. Again, I, I say this all from personal experience. I tried this. I have tried so many different diets and I have tried fasting and things like this. And what it did for me was it put me in this mindset of I would think about food all the time. Normally, I could do OMAD, so one meal a day, go 24 hours and eat once a day and be okay, but the minute I'm like, I'm going to do 28, 48, 72 hour fast, all I could think about was food. My own legs started looking pretty tasty. It just caused these perseverating, these non-stop thinking about food, and everything became about food. It was, it was painful for me. And then it made me require willpower, and I have terrible, terrible willpower, I didn't get 360 pounds having good willpower, to not eat. I think that is a bad place to be when you are morbidly obese, if you have a food addiction, to put yourself where you're relying on willpower, because willpower always eventually fails. Something else to consider with this is I know we all want to lose weight as fast as humanly possible. Who wants to be overweight? Who wants to be miserable and fat? I mean, I don't. However, it's kind of cutting your nose off to spite your face. Trying to push faster, to drop that weight quicker, it puts your body in a stress mode because we're obsessing about the weight loss. We're obsessing about what we eat, how much we eat. You know, all of these things, it's counterproductive because instead of about just getting fat adapted, it's now about I need to lose five pounds this week or 10 or whatever the number that you've set there. It just stresses us out. This is a very hard thing to do, but let it go in the beginning. It might take you two weeks to get fat adapted. It might take you four or six weeks if you're a type two diabetic taking insulin. There's a lot of factors. And the way you know you're fat adapted is when you, one, you start wanting to eat less. And two, if you go periods without meals, you don't feel bad. You don't feel these lulls and things that you do when you're based on glucose. You can use ketone monitors. I did for a few weeks just to check. I don't use them anymore because I know I'm fat adapted. And I find, you know, too many metrics is too much for me. 
You do you though, it's your personal choice if you wanna track all of that. So focus on getting fat adapted. Just focus on eating meats and fats and no carbs. If you're doing keto or carnivore, that's all you have to do. Do not worry about the volume in the beginning. The second thing is consistency. This is key. Consistency does not mean perfection. I have fallen a many a times in my 10 month and two week journey that I have been on this, but it's getting back up every single time, looking at why it happened and putting something into place to prevent it. That is what is important because let's say you go an entire week and then you have a meal off. Okay, figure out why it happened. What can you do to prevent it? And then next time you'll go two weeks before you have a meal off and then one month and then two months and then eventually you get to the point where it's once in a blue moon. Here's a good example. On Sunday, Scott and I went out to dinner with our family. We didn't eat at the restaurant. That is the first time that we have actually gone out with people and not eaten at the restaurant. We decided together that we do not do well eating out, so we will not do it. But I, I want to point out, it took us 10 months and two weeks to get to that point. This is a continual journey don't expect perfection. It is so hard on us. There is no human on this planet that's perfect, no matter how much they may say they are. So don't think you're a failure if you fall. Just know every other human falls on their face all the time. Most people just don't admit it. So here's some things around consistency too. If drinking that diet soda is that one thing that keeps you consistent and on, don't worry about that 2%. Let the diet soda go for now. Get that 98%, that eating your meals like you should be, not eating carbs and other things. Don't worry about the soda. If you're using spices, like I use spices, and I probably always will, would I feel better if I didn't do spices? Maybe, but it is the thing that keeps me on my journey and I'm not willing to sacrifice the 98% of the good eating I do for that 2% that I might feel a little bit better. It's so important to understand this. Now that doesn't mean I'm gonna say, okay, I can have a piece of chocolate once a week that's gonna keep me on the diet. No, be honest and realistic with yourself. Some other things that you can do is snack. If you have to snack in the beginning, do it. Don't do it just because someone says you shouldn't do it and you should get fat adapted as soon as possible. You need to do what's right for you. I'm me, you're you. I can't tell you exactly what to do. You have to base it off your own personal body and experience. Some other things that might help you is Redmond sells salt lick rocks. <laughs> you literally, it's just a rock and you lick it. The salt and the minerals in it are excellent for hunger control. Something else you can do is a bridge drink. You can use coffee, tea, water. I like putting element or electrolyte mix in it and you sip it all day long. This will help with hunger as well. And that is exactly how we got through the restaurant with our family. We had a bridge drink and we had the salt rock that Scott and I were sharing. The second part to being consistent is building good habits and getting rid of bad habits. If you haven't read Atomic Habits, the book is excellent and I wanted to read a quote from there. If you only do the work when it's convenient or exciting, then you'll never be consistent enough to achieve remarkable results. That hit me, I, I wrote it down in my, my journal, like that hit me hard. I used to always just do it when it was convenient or in the beginning when it's exciting, not when it's the boring part. But it matters when it's the boring part that we continue to push through. So do things like, priming your environment. Get rid of the stuff out of the house. If you live with people and you can't, carve out cabinet space, carve out refrigerator space that's just yours. I had someone suggest one time their husband had bread. She would take and literally put a dish towel over the bread in the refrigerator so she didn't have to look at it. Whatever it takes, these small things to set up a space that is not constantly reminding you of what you can't have or you shouldn't have. Another suggestion for building good habits is decrease the amount of steps to complete the habit. They call it make it attractive. Don't make eating well difficult. That means waiting 10 minutes before dinner trying to figure out what you're going to eat. Make it simple. Take your meat out and put it in the refrigerator the night before. Don't give yourself the option to just be like, eh, I'm too lazy to do this. Prep things ahead of time. If you're not a cooker, use crock pots. Use things like Dutch ovens, things you can put in the oven for eight hours, walk away from. Make it simple for yourself. Like dinner Scott just made was flank and ribs. He is an excellent griller. His number one thing is 
the more simple it is, the more likely he's gonna cook. So we choose simple, quick meals. There are some really delicious meals that we've made, but the more time consuming they are, the less I want to make them, and Scott sure doesn't wanna cook them. So we always aim for quick, simple, easy. And here's my suggestions, as well as Atomic Habits suggestions for helping get rid of bad habits. Make it invisible. Make it difficult to do. Make it something that's not constantly reminding you. The reverse of this would be same thing with doing good habits. Get the stuff out of your face. If you don't have to constantly look at cookies, don't do it. Get rid of them. A second thing you can do is make it difficult. So the agreement Scott and I have is if I want some dark chocolate, I have to walk or bicycle there. I cannot drive there and he will not go get it for me. I've made it difficult. I have to take X amount of steps. I can't just want it. I have to physically go there and get it myself, which has stopped me every time. <laughs> Put things like this in place to make it more difficult to get away from these bad habits. Another suggestion is have an accountability partner. Have someone that you will be brutally honest with, not just yourself, because we are really, really good at lying to ourselves and deceiving ourselves. That's how I got to 360 pounds, right? Uh, it's not that bad, Amanda. You're 360 pounds. It's not that bad, but it was that bad. The last part for getting back to the basics is learning our true hunger. It has taken me 10 months and I think I will still be exploring this for probably ever, what my true hunger signals feel like. I really am speaking about people who are overweight and obese and binge eating because this is my experience. People who are underweight or at weight, I've not been there before, so I really can't speak to that. So I just want to be really clear when I'm talking about this. I used to think when my stomach grumbled, that meant I need to eat. But I've learned recently that does not actually mean I'm hungry. All it means is my stomach doesn't have food in it. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Our stomach actually grumbles and makes noise all the time, but we don't hear it because when there's food in there, it's muffled. When there's no food, it's hollow, it echoes, we hear it. So learning that, I realized I don't need to eat as much or nearly as frequently as I thought I did. I use things like the salt rock and the bridge drink to get me past the times that I think I'm hungry. When I'm craving things, I talk with Scott or I journal things. I'm bothered because of X, Y, Z. And here's my reasonable response. Do the salt rock, do the bridge drink, boom, 99% of the time I can move past the cravings. I do wanna reiterate, in the beginning when I was burning carbs, glucose for energy, oh man, the cravings are real because it's a physiological base. The body wants quick, instant fuel and we get that from sugar and carbs. Once you get fat adapted, that is when we really need to start focusing on what is true hunger. I couldn't understand hunger in the beginning because I was hungry all the time and I wanted to gnaw my dang arm off when I wasn't fat adapted. So that's a very important nuance to mention that when you learn hunger, you must be in the fat adapted mode. Otherwise you're fighting against the mental aspect and the physiological aspect. Once you're fat adapted, it's just a mental component that you have to figure out what's going on. I did a video the previous week talking about, am I eating too much? If you're more interested in kind of understanding signals and things like that, that is a excellent video to watch about learning about, you know, especially how I kind of have uncovered what my hunger signals are and aren't. Okay, to reiterate everything, get back to basics if you're struggling. Focus on the 98%. Focus on what you're eating, not the little small things. Get fat adapted. Be consistent. And then learn your hunger signals once you've been fat adapted for a little while. Focus on these things and it makes life so much easier. Don't worry about the spices or the small things that you might not be doing perfectly. Focus on that 98%. Thank you for taking the time and listening. I hope you got something out of this. I appreciate you so very much and I will talk to you soon. Bye.